Turn to page 394. <laughs> Ooh, that's a hot mug, guy. Hey guys, this is my review for The Prisoner of Azkaban. This is the third film in the Harry Potter series, and this was the one that actually divided me from a lot of my friends and fellow fans of the Harry Potter series alike because I did not enjoy this film as much when I watched it as a kid because I thought it was too much of a diversion from the first two films. But watching it now, oh my god, this series needed it. The first two films are basically the peak, the end of what was the late 90s style of cinema. And The Prisoner of Azkaban is a very, very welcome breath of fresh air in terms of the visual perspective, allowing the kids to have much more dynamic range, as well as just a visual representation of J.K. Rowling's world. If I'm correct, this is the closest that they ever got to her representation of the world. And basically what this world has is a lot more quirkiness to it. It has a lot more range. There's a lot more dramatism in terms of the dynamic lighting. Instead of the theatricality of the characters kind of making up for the lacking cinematography, the cinematography is doing the visual storytelling and that's because of Alfonso Cuaron a very, very well decorated director, one of the best in the industry, I could definitely pretty much say. He does what this series needed. His influences into the series, the film series anyways, carried over all the way to the end. It's even carried over into the Fantastic Beast series in terms of visually representing the world. Instead of kind of going for gimmicks, it's showing off the quirkiness and the creativity and the spontaneousness of the world. There's a lot more humor in this film that is not lowbrow or groan inducing. It's actually pretty on the spot and it's very well done. Chris Columbus, give the guy credit. He set up the world, he took on the task of doing the first two films, but Alfonso just does what needs to be done and that's just update and mature the series before the fourth book did. Most people would say that the first three books are still very young adult novels and it's after the fourth one, particularly the ending of the fourth one, that the series grows up. However, with the film series, it happens in the third one and to be honest, it's a very much needed breath of fresh air. We see Harry is going through a much more dramatic and a much more relatable sort of story in terms of being afraid of something and it being related to his own grief, his own misery, and the Dementors while I kind of thought it was a little weird that these were floating cloaks with a dick hole in them, I thought they kind of looked a little bit more like Nazgul's, but a mixture of the two floating demons, Nazgul hoods. These things are probably the scariest thing that Harry Potter introduces, and that's something else that this film did a lot better. The horror of the first two films was kind of like, eh, hey, it was kitty. This one, it spooks you. Not only with the Dementors, but also the representation of the werewolves. When Lupin turns into a werewolf, it's kind of a mix of the traditional style of werewolf as well as the Wendigo, the American Wendigo. It's lanky, it's thin, it's gauntly, yet it's still scary. But in a teenager sort of way, I just think that this film does all the beats right. The relationship between Harry and Lupin is just as good as I remember it being in the book. Their relationship is something that was very much needed because everyone's either addressing Harry as the chosen one or he's just being addressed as, yeah, Harry Potter, you're gonna do great things. Whereas Lupin addresses him like a human or addresses him like a regular person. And also he has this connection with Harry's parents. I've always found the Lupin character to be one of my favorite characters in the entire Harry Potter series. And the actor who takes on the role does a fantastic job with him. As well as Sirius Black. Sirius Black, I never really got connected to as much in the books as most people did. However, obviously in the fifth one, I was still rereading that page over and over again because I was wondering what had happened. But I think that Gary Oldman was a great choice. He looks like crap. Gary Oldman's done a bunch of different roles. The mystery with this one too, they, this one again took a little bit of a risk and I think that this one does a better job at establishing sort of a mystery than the second one did. As well as also introducing a time loop aspect, which Yes, people have torn apart the time, reverse time bell thing aspect to death. However, I do like this element because you think you've got the climax and there are moments that you wish you could take back and the book, or at least in this narrative, you do get that chance. In a sense, you're not able to fully correct everything, but it still hits all of the emotional notes that you got when you read the book. when. 
Lupin turns back into a werewolf, I remember feeling that dread. When Pettigrew gets away, I remember feeling that anger. When Harry saves himself with the Expecto Patronum, I remember feeling this, this victory, this accomplishment for the character. I feel that this book is definitely one of the most important books. It's one that does upgrade itself a little bit, but I feel that Alfonso Cuaron's directing is what takes it just another step higher. It's undeniably one of the best ones in the series. I, I can't deny that. It's very well put together. The cinematography is alive. It has a pulse, whereas the other ones were limited due to the young age of the actors. And then it just, changes things. I was angry that Hagrid's house was at the bottom of a hill, but really in retrospective it's much better to have this kind of real landscape rather than Hagrid's house being in front of a forest and then looking back it's a terrible green screen. I understand the changes that they made. If you want a very interesting retrospective comparison, Alfonso basically took what Columbus had done, tossed out everything that had been established for him, did it himself, and made it better. That's what Rain Johnson thinks he did with The Last Jedi, but he did it half right, because he also brought in a lot of his own garbage. Whereas Alfonso, I don't think he puts in anything that's bad. I don't think there's anything that's in this film that wasn't replaced, wasn't taken away. Maybe the clothes, but they were off and on. They were kind of went back and forth between them being in civvies, then going back to school uniforms. I can definitely say that the costume and hair department is much better than this one because in the fourth one, things get bushy. It gets out of control. But in the end, I'm going to give The Prisoner of Azkaban a 6 out of 7. It's not one of my favorite ones in the series. It's just not one of my favorite stories. I understand why people enjoy it. Maybe it's because everyone about it that gives me that kind of kind of notion towards it, but I'm not going to deny that it's one of the best movies of the entire series. I'm very interested to see if anything beats it. I'm dead serious. Anyways, guys, that's all for me. I hope you enjoyed this review. If you did, leave a like, and if you're interested in more, subscribe. Otherwise, I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching the video. My name is Nitz, and you might remember me from the animated cult classic TV show, Undergrads. It's been a while, but I'm happy to say the click is finally getting back together in an all new movie, thanks to a successful Kickstarter campaign but we are still asking for your support. To see any and all updates about the upcoming Undergrads movie, be sure to check out and like the Bring Back Undergrads Facebook page. And with any luck, we'll see you guys soon.